Laura? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Our year 15 discussion on transition strategies for expiring life tech properties. Um, I'll be kicking us off, and uh, throughout this discussion today, you'll also be hearing from Sharon, a senior disposition manager at Enterprises um, Year 15 Department in Asset Management, and so Candy Felix, a director with Enterprises Tax and Regional Accounting Team. The discussion today is uh, on the LIHTC housing stock, which nationwide has produced nearly 3 million units to date since its inception. A variety of urban, suburban, and rural uh, housing projects across the con country, providing housing for families, seniors, and people with special needs, some of them being very deeply targeted. The uh, report shows that 64% of residents in the tech program are or at um, 40% AMI. And approaching uh, the 30-year anniversary of this program, whereby some of the very first projects will be coming out of the program altogether, having met all their demands in accordance with their extended use restrictions, and uh, could be converted to market. Uh, experience to date, among those nearly 3 million units nationwide that the program has produced, our disposition department's experience is uh, that we have thus far transferred 773 projects through May 1st of 2017. 17 of those have been lease purchase deals whereby the units, the homes, were sold, uh, or at least offered for sale to the tenants at affordable prices in accordance with Section 2 and its IRS revenue rulings. Uh, we have 14 consulting deals where we've represented other investors on their uh, dispositions. We've seen about 21 of our deals that we've exited either with us or with um, other syndicators that we are aware of. The, by comparison, these numbers, uh, the number of deals having gone through the lease purchase or resyndication are relatively small compared to the 773 deals that we've exited date. And with pipeline, we're working on about 105 remaining dispositions through the end of 2017, and our pipeline is about uh, exits per year over the next five years. So this background on um, our experience within the wider market and um, the objectives of today's training are as such. You know, first to discuss general background on your 15. Discussing some key exit options, including the right of first refusal and out option. Um, the perspectives of various stakeholders in this process. We have a small primer discussion on whether or not re-syndication is feasible. Uh, Gini is going to present some uh, information on capital accounts and exit taxes, um, just basics on, on what a typical developer needs to know about in planning for the year 15 exit process. There's going to be a discussion uh, on our, our suggestions to develop to partners on how they should develop their action plan for their properties approaching year 15. We've got two case studies as well that we can walk through and in, in, in showing you how we can sometimes look at value of a partnership and uh, what the proposed exit strategy would be in those various circumstances. So, mantra for this process is going to be, you know, first to, to know your property, second to know your partners and your stakeholders, three is a big one, to know your documents, and step four is uh, to develop a plan. These are recommendations and mantras for general partners preparing for year 15 for their properties. Uh, these, particularly knowing your documents and knowing your, your, your property, we, we can hardly emphasize strongly enough. There are uh, many stakeholders involved in the Year 15 process. They might think of Year 15 in different ways. As an employee of a syndicator, I might often talk about Year 15 from the perspective of a syndicator and investors that uh, I'm representing. Uh, but this presentation is also geared towards general partners and sponsors, and we hope to provide some useful suggestions for uh, how our partners can not only prepare for exiting investor, also prepare for various uh, 
structuring plans uh, for the long term for those properties and how to maintain affordability for the tenant population that it is already serving. Uh, as you may be aware on the phone, um, typical structure of a live tech investment, uh, at least those types of investments that enterprise engages in most frequently, is that an investor or multiple investors will invest their equity in a fund, which we manage as the 0.01% partner. Enterprise would represent that as the general partner. And the fund, with all of its equity, maybe from one or multiple investors, will invest that equity in one or more projects, underlying projects, which we sometimes call the lower tier. And those lower tier agreements, Enterprise is going to represent the fund as the 99.99% limited partner. And the operating general partner, who's usually also the developer on the ground, is going to represent the 0.01% general partner. And we highlight this because whenever you have an equity fund and a project, entities are going to be created by and managed by their own limitship agreement or operating agreement. And so whenever you're, if you're a general partner on the ground and you're engaging your limited partner for perhaps a consent to go forward with a refinance or consent to go forward with a particular Year 15 exit strategy. You're dealing with us as enterprise. Also, to be aware that enterprise is also in that equity fund box up ahead, and you know a separate agreement with our investors that require us to come up with a plan of action with our lower tier general partner, but then take that plan up to our investors as well to get their consent. Same. Many of these LIHTC investments are sold to limited partnerships or LLCs. Uh, know your documents. Uh, into the documents is one of the first things Sean or I will do when we start looking at a particular deal and what a reasonable year 15 exit strategy may be. Or look through that limited partnership agreement and get an understanding of what the transfer restrictions are and any transfer price that's contemplated by the agreement, what consent requirements would be necessary, how proceeds would be distributed if we're talking about a, a capital event and also liquidation and dissolution. And we have general partners read those documents and be aware of those rights and responsibilities as well and come to the table. Just a quick comment on the different types of investors a general partner, a lower tier general partner may be engaging with. There are direct investors out there in the market where you may be dealing with one uh, individual investor they can uh, negotiate with directly. Enterprise is a second option. We're a syndicator where we've organized the investment funds and we are representing one or multiple uh, investors in that fund. And then with syndicators, as we may find, you know, national for-profits, national non-profits, or, or regional syndicators, which may all change the dynamic of who the ultimate investors are and how that syndicator may be may or may not be able to make decisions on behalf of their Fund. So our, our year 15 enterprises, year 15 departmental goals when we're looking at projects and year 15 and what our recommended exit strategy is going to be, these are our goals. First and foremost, to deliver the uh, in expected investor benefits to our investors as a fiduciary to them. And then mentally, to exit that investment investor from these deals uh, in year 16, preferably in the first quarter. Of year 16, that time the project has received um, it really has received all the equity cap contributions from the investment fund. The investor in return has usually received all the um, expected credits. So there's there's no more benefit flowing in either direction, and it's a useful time to wind down that relationship. Ours ultimately to transfer ownership to sponsors. That is the way we tend to structure our limited partnership agreements up front. That's how what we anticipate in the exit strategy at the end. Uh, depending on your syndicator um, or your investor and what documents you signed on the front end, that may not always be the case. Sometimes there are agreements where the parties agree that the year 15 exit strategy may be a sale of the project uh, 
on the market, for example. But we do tend to typically here at Enterprise set up our documents to contemplate the ultimate transfer of ownership to the sponsor in some way. We do our sponsors to help develop your 15 transition plans by providing you know, the resources that we may have available to us. We desire to preserve affordability and minimize displacement of low-income residents. We are a double bottom-lined company, and we have the success of these projects going forward for the long term, even after we've exited. Uh, and then we can continue, uh, you know, we have departments that can assist looking at the and determining whether or not it's a really syndication candidate and or perhaps uh, whether its needs can be met by a refinance. So the sequence of year 15, nothing automatically happens at year 15 except that the risk profile associated with credit loss has, has ended. You're, you're in the year, so to speak, when it comes to IRS recapture with certain statute of limitations for them to look back. back. Again, and that means the, the investor can exit starting on day one of year 16 without an early exit recapture. And you know, perhaps also more importantly is that your your investors probably do expect to exit after 15 years. They tend to plan for these investments in 15-year holding uh, analysis um, are ready to dispose starting, again, day one of year 16. So, Candy, just real quick, primer, calculate your year 15 date. Right, thanks, Laura. Turning you. Year 15 is important because you know, you need to know what year you can start thinking about transferring your your partnership. The last the, the year 15 is the last day in the 15th year in which you first took credit, and I know that's that's a whole lot. Especially if you've got multiple buildings. Some of our projects have multiple buildings, and they start credits in different years. So you have to make sure that you're picking the right year for year 15, and it's usually the last bill that you decide to take credit in. So then you would plan your disposition in that year. Here's a quick example to help you get how to do that. So in this example, the project got credits allocated to them in 1999. The full year window for 9% deals to place it in service. The construction was done and the building was placed in service in 2000. They to, de to credits in 2001, which means they deferred the first year because the building done in 2000, but they placed the elected to take credits in 2001. The period would end in uh, 12-15. So if we're taking credits for the first time in 2001, you know, the accountants like this part because they get to calculate using their fingers or tools or whatever's <laughs> available to calculate. If I start my credit in 2001 and I, I add 14, I have to add 14 years to that. So they can use fingers to get that quick math, and it would result in a compliance period ending at the 11:15 on 12:31:15. So that means that your year 15 is 16 is. Begin January 1, 2016, the example that we just talked about. So, right back to Laura, I believe. Yep. So, now I can discuss some meat and potatoes of some specific exit strategies that are um, available. Um, and much of this will be spoken from the perspective of enterprise and what we typically find in our limited partnership agreements, but some of it may be universally applicable as well. We're going to go over uh, right of first refusal, buy options, qualified contracts, borrowers early exits, and puts, which are typically options for a limited partner to put their interest to general partner at a formula price, and sales to third parties. And I'll have some discussion on how common these are, or in some cases how uncommon they are. Starting with the right of first refusal, uh, Section 32 specifically granted that these limited partnership agreements in, Lit in LITEC properties could be set up to grant a qualified entity a right of first refusal to purchase the real LITEC property for a formula price equal to the minimum of debt plus exit taxes 
And then typically parties could also agree to add some adjusters um, for any unpaid benefits due to the limited party. And again, qualified entities per Section 42 that are qualified to receive this right of first refusal are tenants and associations, resident management corporations, qualified nonprofits, and government agencies such as a housing authority. Issues with the right of first refusal, we do not see it being exercised very often. Uh, most is by definition, the right of first refusal is not triggered until the property is put up for sale and there's a bona fide third party offer. Questions arise about whether or not obtaining that bona fide third party offer is really required or worth everyone's time. And I can tell you that so far in the right of first refusal, refusals that uh, we've been engaged in. We have not required bona fide third party offers. Um, it's not typically investor requirement or has not been thus far. Uh, it's not to say there aren't some cases where your right of first refusal language might, might be very specific, requiring that this cannot happen unless a bona fide third party offer is received. You may also be dealing with, uh, you know, depending on your investor, depending on your own attorney. Uh, the party involved and the stakeholders involved may have different appetites for whether or not that's required. The issue is that the right of first refusal is typically written up as a right to purchase the real estate. And then typically once you sell the real estate, the partnership starts the automatic liquidation process. Um, so the reserves are typically not included. Uh, they be distributed in accordance with the limited partnership agreement in accordance with various liquidation waterfalls that are spelled out in the agreement. Um, when you are selling real estate, another issue with the right of first refusal is that it tends to be a little bit more pricey based on a transaction and cost perspective and since it results in transfer taxes, reaction fees, there may be uh, um, finance and payoff of debt which may include prepayment penalties. Our experience we have found that depending on the specifics of the deal and whether or not transfer taxes are relevant in the particular locality, uh, or for a transfer of limited partnership interest is typically uh, preferable from a transaction cost perspective if the sponsor wants to maintain control in some way, shape, or form through its affiliate. And the right of first refusal is for minimum purchase price of debt plus taxes, the formula price often exceed the fair market value of the real estate in, in our portfolio. Next option I want to talk about is the buy option. And again, this is going to be that option as may typically be found in an enterprise agreement. Where the general partner or an affiliated entity will have a right within the limited partnership agreement to purchase the limited partner's interest for a formula price, which is typically the greater of the fair market value of the partnership interest for any unpaid benefits due the investor plus exit taxes. And in this case, also uh, be careful to look how fair market value is defined in the limited partnership agreement. Often, even though in this buyout option, what you're actually doing is purchasing the limited partner's interest. The limitership agreement may say that the way you calculate fair market value is you actually go through a modeling, a sale of the real estate and liquidation of the partnership to determine what the limited partner would get if that happened, and that is what you buy their interest for. That is, of course, very specific to the deal and how that option was written up, though. And I want to touch upon is the qualified contract. This is the option that's written into Section 42, uh, where the government says, all right, starting on day one of year 15, these LIHTC projects can apply to their state to fund um, a buyer for the property at a formula price, uh, equal to the outstanding debt on the property, plus any capital invested, which is adjusted by a cost of living factor up to 5%, less any distributions and funds available for distribution. Uh, our, um, to define what that application process is. And if a project were able to successfully follow the requirements of that application process, it would then be in the state's hands to find a buyer for that formula price. And if the buyer was not found within one year, the extended uh, use restrictions would be terminated. 
it deals the enterprises exiting we have not been seeing uh, much interest in general partners in pursuing this strategy outside of very specific cases, very specific states. Times where a buyer, uh, excuse me, a general partner is not really interested in flipping a deal to market. Uh, we've seen this utilized in cases where I just simply want to eliminate some administrative burden associated with the extended use restriction and being monitored by their state agency uh, and reduce costs. costs so that they can continue to serve a low-income population or perhaps just maybe expand a little bit the population that they're able to lease to. So we're still not typically seeing this being utilized in the market. States also tend to have burdensome application processes that make this option uh, less feasible. And then is a bargain sale. Again, uh, we have not seen these. In fact, I don't think we have seen uh, any bargain sale completed since the year 2008. In concept, it is available and you have a project with value and excess of debt. And perhaps you had an investor that um, needed a tax write-off, maybe more than they were interested in negotiating a sales price. They could donate the value of their interest if they transferred their, the entirety of their interest over to a qualified nonprofit for, say, a dollar, they could get a partial tax write-off for the value of what was being essentially donated. 2008, interest have typically been more motivated to no, negotiate a fair market sales price instead of taking a tax write-off. Uh, the option is an early exit, which uh, is engendering a lot of interest in the marketplace right now. It is feasible when, or by definition, it's an early exit when um, an investor exits a limited partnership uh, deal prior to the end of year 15 for that deal. I think that early exits may not be feasible for multiple investor funds. There tend to be stringent investor consent environments associated with early exits dealing with multiple investors, it, it may be infeasible to reach agreement on all that, that a majority of investors would approve of with a reasonable time frame. The agreement is almost always going to be required uh, for an operating general partner interested in pursuing early exit in order to protect the exiting investor. What that entity agreement is going to do is it's going to uh, provide an indemnitor that is willing to cover any recapture that the investor may incur for recapture events occurring after the early exit but before the end of the compliance period. So the early exit, any, any credit guarantees in the limited partnership agreement would apply and from the period from early exit to year 15, the indemnity agreement applies. And typically that indemnity agreement is going to be stronger than any guarantees that you put up in the limited partnership agreement. And that's by design because that would probably be necessary to entice an investor to agree to exit uh, prior to year 16. And I'm not seeing any, oh, am I seeing some questions? Here, let me take a look at some questions real quick before we go into recent vacations. We do have a couple of questions in, and our first question is, debt included in the formula price usually include soft debt from a public agency? Uh, both for the first refusal, I assume that a question applies to, and depends on how that ROFR is written in the limited partnership agreement, but I've typically seen that included, yes. Soft, soft debt, any affiliated debt, and any accrued income on that debt. Here's the, the partnership document will we'll refer to um, debt uh, secured by the property. Uh, and that will point to all debt that's on the partnership. Okay. And the other question we have in here is, in Washington State, uh, w bars shows a placed in service date for each tax credit property. Will the end of year 15 be 15 years later 
does placed in service date equal the first year that tax credits were taken? Okay. Not really, no, no because it, year, the, the year one date for your, your e-building really starts the first year you, you took some credits on it. You don't have to take all the credits. Uh, but the first year you take credits on a building be the year you placed it in service, or it can be the year after you placed it in service. Correct. And a couple more have come in. What have been some of the objections that you've heard from investors regarding early exits? Heidi, really? Um, I would say there's any one comp objection, some, and then on the on the, the flip side is that some investors are very interested in it. There is just a, a, a wide variety of interest or disinterest depending on you know the individual investor's appetite. one for now is, given the housing crisis and our focus on policy, to what extent can or should we, and what will take, to shift the year 15 priorities to place preserving affordability and preventing displacement at the top of our priority list? A whole um, separate presentation on that. Yes, it's a very good um, common enterprise is heavily engaged engaged in preservation efforts. We have an entire preservation uh, working team that does a lot of outreach and engagement with not only general partners, but they do engagement with uh, different states in understanding whether or not preservation is prioritized in qualified allocation plans. What, and you know, another very important option is whether or not states uh, loan products that are available to preserve these deals. Some of the uh, biggest issues with preserving housing um, is finding funding necessary to keep the physical plant in reasonable and a viable condition. And we do have we have a couple more. Do you want to take them now, or should we hold this till later? Oh. In an option agreement to allow the general, general partner to purchase property, but the general partner wants to purchase limited partner interest, do you see an opportunity to negotiate the sale price? If I understood the, correction, uh, the question correctly, it's regarding a right of first refusal to purchase the real estate. Would the investor consider doing a transfer of limited partnership interest instead? And the answer is yes, that is typically um, rather easy exception to make. If you are talking about a transfer of the limited partnerships interest for the exact same amount they would have received if you exercised the right of first refusal verbatim. And uh, one more, or shall we move on? Sure. So, yeah, let's, uh, well, it's all from my head. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, saying a third party will pay more than the qualified contract price, does the state have the ability to require that the property is sold to a qualified buyer at contract price in order for it to not have to comply with the extended use period? Ooh. Sorry, I third party will pay more than the qualified contract price. Does the state have the ability to require that the property is sold to a qualified buyer at contract price in order for it to not have to comply with the extended use period? Good question. Um, and so that might be above and beyond our knowledge since we are not directly engaged in qualified applications with the state. But um, something that might help is that typically states say you're able to obtain an offer kind of meets the requirements of the process, um, then their obligations have been met. And I have seen state write-ups that said even if the, if the seller, 
the sale of the LIHTC property does not close on that ultimate sale, then it should be understood that the extended use restrictions would not go away because all the state has to do to present a buyer at some leading 42 defined requirement. If that completely answered the question, and, there, and you know, someone could certainly reach out to me separately. Uh, emails are going to be at the end of this presentation. If you don't know the answer um, to this level of specificity, we can probably find someone that could help you out. So, um, to a brief primer on whether or not resyndication uh, is an option for general partners to consider if they've got properties coming up on year 15 and are interested in learning whether or not they can resyndicate it. Uh, with the learning that we don't work in the resyndication uh, department, uh, I hope to give you some, some pretty good information. Um, specifics would probably, we'd probably need to hook up with someone in our syndication department if you had uh, good questions because we know just enough to be a little bit dangerous and get ourselves in trouble. <laughs> but resyndication may be an option for you if your, your property is coming up on year 15 and it needs capital improvements. You're going to make sure that your property has at least um, capital needs of 20% of a, a potential acquisition basis or $6,000 per unit. But being said, there are so many fixed costs involved in underwriting these deals and um, such a competitive market out there, that just in order to underwrite and to make the numbers work, you're probably going to want at least 30,000 per unit to have a viable uh, underwriting for a re-syndication. Um, think ahead about how you want to structure your current investor's exit in order to preserve uh, the possibility of obtaining an acquisition credit if you can. There are problems if your buyers and sellers are related parties, meaning that the buyer and the seller, all entities combined, hold more than a 50% common interest. The project has to comply with a 10-year look-back rule, whereby it cannot have been sold within the past 10 years, with um, exemptions available for nonprofit buyers and or projects that are substantially financed or operated under a USDA or state program. Uh, Enterprise does. Um, majority of our business with properties that would um, get exempted under these exceptions. So that, that one's typically not a hard, hard requirement to meet in our experience. Also, if your existing LURA, if you want to resyndicate again, you'll add another LURA, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your old LURA goes away. And LURA, I'm talking about a land use restriction agreement, and sometimes we use that, that acronym interchangeably with EUA, which is your extended use agreement. And if you uh, get a syndication, that doesn't um, that change the fact that your existing tenants will have a three-year protection against um, improper evictions. Because your vacant unit rule, if you're, let's say, in your 13, 14, you know you're going to want to resyndicate, and you know uh, maybe it would be easier if you could leave some of your vacating units vacant in preparation for uh, a substantial rehab. Uh, if you're still within the first 15-year compliance period, you, you have to lease them up. Otherwise, you could trigger recapture for your current uh, um, current investors. Uh, to find out who your original LIHTC deal investors were, actually, the way the market tends to be doing this right now in order you know, to meet the expectations of privacy of some of the investors in, in these proprietary funds is that when you syndicate a deal, your syndicator, what's typically happening in the market now, is your syndicator is asking each investor invest in that fund to self-certify whether or not they've been invested in that deal previously. Uh, so you, you, know, you as the operating general partner or the operating general partner's attorney probably don't need to go out and do research on who your new or potentially your old investors were anymore uh, because that's being handled by the syndicators who are re-syndicating it. Uh, focus on appropriate appraisals for acquisition credit purposes with total value split between the land and the building. You're going to need to split those for, to determine different bases. 
Okay, you'd be aware of uh, amending existing loans because uh, forgiving soft debt before your new investor uh, comes into the deal. You want to do that so your new investor doesn't incur cancellation of debt income, which could hurt the return you promised to deliver them. You're going to pass, uh, pay attention to passing the 50% test on building by building basis, which can be a challenge in some circumstances. And as mentioned before, there's there's a certain minimum minimum deal that you're going to need to put together before competitive in the resyndication market these days. Uh, before it's about thirty thousand per unit, and we're also talking about you know about five hundred thousand annual allocation. So groups, in order to to reach these uh, larger size dollar amounts, are bundling deals within common markets. You could take multiple buildings across a neighborhood or across a city even and re-indicate it as one as a project owned under one limited partnership. But you have portfolio deals, they're not necessarily easier. In fact, they're they're probably har harder, they're they're bigger and slightly more efficient at reaching numbers you're gonna need to reach in order to make a resyndication viable. Uh, FHA tax exempt debt over uh, a taxable structure with collateralized bonds. Uh, the funds uh, earlier, so the equity pricing is lower. Uh, borrowing cap capacity is much higher currently. And to keep an eye on the true debt analysis as well as managed capital accounts. So um, engage your debt and equity providers early uh, so that everybody can be involved in a stakeholder in putting that deal together. It's pretty complicated. So um, you want your partners to be able to assist you in opening potential pitfalls. Because, um, that was just a primer on resyndication. If anyone has specific questions, uh, reach out to us, and we'll probably get you connected with the right person here at Enterprise. Thanks, Laura. We'll just talk a little bit about the capital accounts and exit taxes. But before I go to the exit taxes, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what comprises your capital account, how you how you run into an issue where you'd have to pay exit taxes. LP account really consists of the initial investment, the equity that we pay for, the credits that we get. So that's capital contribution. Any distributions that we get, direct reduction in that that equity that we put into the deal. Tax losses is also a benefit that we get that reduces our capital account. If the project is getting historic tax credit, that's a direct reduction to our investment, so that would reduce your LP capital account. And any syndicating costs that we pay directly for formation of the limited partner's interest, not the partnership interest, but the limited partnership. By definition, the limited partner's capital account can't go negative because it's limited to your investment. However, the tax the whole section that we can do probably two weeks of training on that's called minimum gain. And just to put it, it's the non course debt. So it's the debt that is secured by the building, which means that no partner in the partnership owns the, the has the liability to pay it back if something to go away. And determine the the non recourse debt the, that you put against your taxable book value. So it's your taxable as your building, that's your taxable depreciation, and not the gap basis, but just tax basis. And the difference between the two will give you a minimum gain if your debt is more than your building, because what they're saying is that you can sell your debt for a building that is less than your debt. So then that will have positive minimum gain. And the IRS allows us, the, the code in the IRS allows us, 704B, allows us to use that, get that difference as, as as positive capital, which we can draw down on. But by that, you're also taking funds the day that you might have to end up paying at the end of the day. So we we only make sure we're doing what the expectation is. In the limited partner's capital account has to be zero. You have to back to where your investment net of your benefits has got to be zero. If you have a positive capital account in there, you have to put more 
account that was needed for your pitch that you received, and that means you've, you've got a loss, and you have to write that off. If you have negative balance, it means you've gotten a gain because you have taken more than your investment. And it's at this point where you have minimum gain. So you might be able to take losses in, exce in ex uh, excess of your investment. Now it's time for you to hyper because you've got more benefits than your investment. And there's always a time value of money concept, you know, in, in to the new you an investment, and we're sitting in year 15, you've got a negative capital account. The dollar in 2000 is not as much as it is today. So there's some benefits in taking losses in investment if you have minimum gain. Let's walk through a couple of examples of capital accounts and different ones that we see here at Enterprise. As I mentioned before, we do track or hack our limited partners tax basis every get a tax return so we can tell what partnership is, is going to be in a situation where the capital account is going to be negative, whether it's permissibly or impermissibly. You know, it'll be permissibly if you've got minimum gain. So if we determine that your account is going to go negative, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit later about how do we fix that so we don't end up in a situation where we can take our loss or benefits that are, that are to us. Example where the arrow is positioned, it's year 15, and our investment sort of equals, or, or capital account sort of, which means that we've gotten back nearly all of what we've invested. We like to see this because we don't have to do a lot, uh, a lot of work here. It means that our projections were right on point. Everything was going good with the operation and we're good to go. So example one is, is, is good, but you all know we live in the real world and things happen, so um, it doesn't always end up this way. An example is still with the compliance period, but it's outside of the credit period. And if we had a 10-year credit period, now we're sitting in year 13 or close to year 13, and our account is about to go negative. And it's at the point we'll determine whether we have to start adjusting the losses and reallocating it to the other partners in the partnership since the partner cannot go negative. Third example is a position we don't like to see in enterprise does not on the right deals that would put our limited partner's capital account to go negative before the end of the credit period. So it looks a lot of benefits came in and our capital account has been depleted much faster than we were expecting. We can lose losses and have an inability to take credit if our account is negative. Under that concept we talked about, about minimum gain, which gives us that boost in limited partners' capital account. So we feel about this, but sometimes we end up, if there's something that's happening with the operations, that more losses are a limited partner. So in the tax example, the limited partner has a capital account of 500000 negative 500000 and we're getting ready to get out of the deal. The IRS is saying, you've gone over your investment by 500000 and your cap rate is 35%, the federal tax rate is 35%, so you have to find $175,000 to cover the benefits that you have taken outside of what your investment was. Uh, Laura can tell you, Laura and Sean can tell you more about whether we pay the exit taxes, but this is something that's written in the partnership agreement that the general partner is responsible for. So uh, we, we, we track it so we make sure that you, you know that it's out there. But the exit taxes creates a tax event. So every time the pays our a tax, it creates a taxable event, and we just use a gross up tax of 1.35. Uh, we don't go above that. So in this case, if we've got a negative capital account, we're asking the taxes on this deal will be $136,000, uh, which is not what we want to see. 
So to, to mitigate or, or manage the taxes would be from 11 to 15 to save debt. So we would we'd ask that you write off debt that is not secured by the building because if you use debt that secures the building, then you're reducing your minimum gain or potential minimum gain. So if you've got your partner debt or, or uh, other soft money, we probably can look at writing that off. We don't do this a lot, but we can reduce the limited partner's interest by one-third, which would trigger technical term. Uh, we can limit the debt to see if we can relate the debt. So when we close the deal, it might have been general partner loan, but if the general partner has the ability to funds at, at uh, AFR, we could probably look at making the non-recourse and add a security to the debt to the building. We'll have to get permission from all the other lenders and stuff, but that's what we could do. We're looking at capitalizing some of the annual expenses that happen rather than running them through the income statement. We just capitalize them. All the capitalization policy that you would have already determined if it you know, improves the building and extends the life, it might be a capitalizable item rather than hitting the income statement right away. You know, we wouldn't, I, I don't usually like to say this one, but if we can improve operations, I, I think at this point we would have tried everything we could do to improve operations. But nonetheless, there might be some gains we can make there by improving the operations. And in 16, we could do a bargain sale, which we don't do a whole lot of. for paying our exit taxes, so we would we be hit the deal or refinance with a loan that includes the exit taxes, so you'd have a bigger loan balance. Um, and once we we purchased the, the deal, we'd have sufficient proofs to help offset the exit taxes. You can use some of the reserves to pay off exit taxes if they're not restricted or have that can be used to a regulatory agreement or something, we might be able to use some of the exit taxes or, I mean, some of the cash that's on the balance sheet at that time. And apply a back adjuster, so we just adjust the the equity and the, the numbers so that it works to cover exit taxes, or have the, um, which I know a lot of our folks like, is to have the investor absorb the exit taxes at their level. I hand it over to Sean. At this point, over the next series of slides, I'm going to talk about a plan that the general partner can develop, the lower tier general partner can develop to make the year 15 disposition a much smoother process. Early proactive planning is key here. I don't want any surprises at year 15 or halfway through year 14. So these Next slides are going to cover some ideas and thoughts for uh, um, general partners to, to take into consideration, but this will also help any lenders in the audience or uh, other holders. Uh, obstacles the general partner and limited partner face at year 15. Um, when I say obstacles, just item may delay the process or require more due diligence at year 15. Now, we really to start a plan early in, in year 10. Um, here in this first bulleted item, we talk about a plan that's going to take us through year 15. Um, and when I say through year 15, one of the bigger issues that comes up at year 15 is uh, replacement reserve balances. Um, and sometimes partners will hold on those, ca that, those cash assets uh, really for the future, thinking, okay, if something comes up but we need a roof in the future, we don't want to spend this money now. And it may come at the expense of the, the existing property right now, the form of a deferred maintenance. And defense is any issue that you really should, in the property that should be taken care of by chin. And if it's not, like it was for, for example, if it's a water leak, and maybe it's a small water leak in some windows, and you, you're thinking you hold off on the only type of major repairs, until year 15, a small problem can, can grow into a, a big problem quickly. Uh, not only will you burn probably more of your cash assets, cash assets by not uh, directly facing the deferred maintenance, uh, at year 15, if that money is still sitting in the replacement reserve, 
cash asset. You have a tough conversation when it comes to if there's value in the partnership. You know, should that cash stay in the in the partnership since it wasn't rolled into the property? In other words, you know, repairs weren't made. Uh, one developer plan is, plan is going to take you through year 15 and um, adequately and correctly spend the assets or cash on repair or maintenance of the building to, so you can keep the operating environment and an efficient operating environment. But so we want to take we'll want to take you through um, real the remainder of your compliance period, your extended use period, and that could be 15 or 45 more years. To the state and the uh, specifics of your partnership and then its use agreement. So you want it's going to take you through in the long term as well. Obviously, this all begins with a determination of your when your compliance period actually ends. And as can you can use your fingers and toes, mm -hmm. or if you don't want to take your shoes off, just add 14 to the first year, you'll get to year 15. From a partner's perspective, you'll want to determine whether you have the capacity and the desire to maintain the project and to keep operating the project uh, for the next 15 or years. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, partners were jumping into business maybe for the first time, and maybe they don't have the they haven't grown or they don't have the economic capacity to maintain the property going forward. So you want that determination at this point. And from a partner's perspective, you just we can make is to reach out to your syndicator early on and find out if the is flexible with a, a sale or a transfer of LP interest. And I mentioned, you know, we do one of our primary objectives is to the benefits are uh, realized as we are by do share of the a partner of, the, of our investors. So I want to uh, make a determination again. That can be through a conversation with your syndicator or if you. Can Keep under tax records yourself uh, whether or not benefits have been delivered. It's time to review your current performance, uh, cash flow predictions, and your, your actual and projected cash flows, and make sure that future operations can be maintained at the same level or maybe even a more efficient level going forward. Sizes that come up. Loss of the tax abatement or rental cities or any other changes in the budget that were uh, maybe not foreseen or else forgotten. Um, make sure that you have uh, some cash flow through operations that's going to maintain the property going forward. And view the market conditions at this time. Make sure that your project's going to, be, to remain marketable in the future. And when we're marketable here, we're not necessarily talking about the sale of the property, we're talking about. Um, the rental of the unit. So, can you contain your uh, occupancy where you would like it to be, where it needs to be? Uh, do you see any other competition going online, new projects in the area that may impact um, your unit? Uh, so, if uh, there's regular your units are competing with market rate rental units, those projects in the future. Also, look at the capital needs of the project. As I mentioned earlier, uh, look at your replacement rebalance and determine um, our recommendation is actually to get a third party assessment of your capital needs rather than in internally. And consider getting a green CNA because a green green movement of the future not only is it a uh, you know, popular development uh, uh, incentive, but it also uh, it'll make your property more efficient and green. The standard CNA will, uh, when I say CNA, it's, CNA, it's obviously capital needs assessment, but a green CNA will um, adequately address the cost of converting a building into a more efficient project. Um, as far as your reserve balances, you know, there may be restrictions on not only, well, there may be restrictions on how much you can spend on an annual basis, but there may be restrictions on how they can get distributed upon transfer of an LP interest. Lead your partnership documents, the restrictions that a lender may impose, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Can't do, you know, we have a capital account that may generate um, some exit taxes that year 15. So if there are going to be exit taxes, how can we address those when the time comes? 
At year 15 and year 13 and 14, try to make an accurate assessment of your debt and make sure that there's not any balloon payments due right at year 15 or right after. And if they are due, uh, determine how you're going to make those payments. You may get an appraisal uh, or maybe a broker opinion of value to determine your value of your real estate and compare that to your debt value to see if your the value of your real estate exceeds the value of the debt. Uh, the structuring of loans, you know, we, at this point, it's a good time to figure out if these loans can be uh, forgiven or restructured going forward. Now, most times you're going to need, at least in our agreements, you'll need uh, limited partner consent on any type of restructuring of debt. So reach out early and often with your syndicator to make sure that uh, those Everybody enough time to get those limit or limited investor approvals for actually the debt, and because this finance can um, generate either creation of phantom value or it may uh, create uh, phantom that I don't know address, and it may approval rates on the uh, on foot and on the limited partner side. After reviewing all your financials, you should come up with a pretty good idea of um, what the likely purchase price was going to be. We always refer to the partnership documents in our first conversations with the general partners when we're approving 15, because that's the first step. What do the, what, what the documents say? What are the right both sides? In the, and if you have a right of first refusal or a buyout option, the economic sense does it make? Um, does it fit in plans? Do you have the funds to? Those prices, and will you, if you're e either one of those options, can the property still be maintained with the resources that are left over after the acquisition? There are several of funding, obviously, as resyndication or refinance are, are very uh, common. Reserves can typically be uh, used to acquire the limited partner interest. The only thing, again, you want to make sure is you have enough reserves left over after that acquisition to maintain property going forward. Now, if there's equity in your real estate, it's going to be an easier, easier hurdle to uh, face because you can always refinance and maybe do some cash out uh, in your restructuring of debt. And in 15, this is a good time to reach out to your accountant and your attorney and meet with a syndicator like you're doing here today. Appreciate a purchase price. Uh, as you're going to see our examples here, um, on the buyout option or the right of first if you so we'll spell price, but it might not make economic sense given long-term plans of the partnership. Um, and if partners want to step outside the partnership agreement, that becomes a negotiation. In other words, if we're not going to buy, follow the buyout option per as written in the documents or the right of first refusal per the code or all that is written in the documents, then it becomes a, a negotiation. But assume you reach an agreement. Uh, guys would send out a letter of intent. We have a partner to reach out early as possible to the lenders to obtain any kind of lender approvals. And this often delays and it is at the fifth hour, both sides realize that lender consent has not been obtained. So that's, uh, maybe a state level type of lender that sometimes can require a lot of layers of approval and can take a very long time. Um, involved, there may be a uh, Transfer of physical assets, TPA as it's called, involved or a modified TPA, and take three, four months, and I've had them take as long as a year. Our address, we can draft legal documents and effectuate the transfer of interest, and again, it will happen after the, the effect date will be after 1231 of your team, because we don't want to exit our as we've had process of an early exit that Laura mentioned. In year 16, we try to, enterprise, we tried to close in the, in the first quarter 16. And if a poll, we asked the limited partner, excuse me, the general partner to file a, a certificate of limited, uh, certificate of limited partnership. We have final K-1s and tax returns, we call a technical termination, and execute the amendment, which will be an amendment to the 
the current limited partnership agreement, which will bring in the new substitute limited partner that would take our interest. And we also uh, executed an assignment document that would assign the limited partner interest to the new substitute limited partner. Now what we're talking about today were issues that were discussed in the beginning and we named this slide back to the future for that reason. Uh, sum up, you know, is your financing to an extent to get through the, the restriction period? Are there rental subsidies? Will they continue or will they terminate at some point in the near future? And the same with ballooning debt. Is any ballooning debt due now? Are A15 at an East West? And hard look at your, your improvements and again, recommend a third party needs assessment to determine a project needs significant minutes or uh, upgrades to maintain operations at the current level going forward. And at a resyndication, obviously you want to re-examine the uh, state agency scoring criteria to see which is the best, best fit. And since we have different, several options for considering to tax, um, which at this time, and we'll go through these, these, these several ways of, of, of addressing that. Now, for the case studies that we're going to talk about, we're going to, one's going to be a deal for uh, value, and one will be a project without value. Now, the starting point when we mention value here is, is what the debt assets the partnership holds. Primary asset of the, of the partnership is typically the real estate. We add to all other assets, and this comes as a surprise to some partners at year 15. Is we have all assets of the partnership, which includes reserves, replacement reserves, operating reserves, escrows, cash, assets that are on your balance sheet. We compare them to any liabilities that are on your balance sheet. We know that out, and that includes hard and soft debt. We do we come up with a, po a positive part value, well, then there's going to be, a, uh, typically going to be a um, strong indication for a value to a limited partner interest. Not always, but um, if a part itself has a positive part value, then we have to take the next step and determine if what the value of the limited partner interest is. So my code case study is going to be a, a partnership that does not value an excessive debt. You were in uh, year 15, property was available for sale in 2017. We have a nonprofit sponsor, the right of first refusal to purchase the property for debt plus taxes, a typical um, that we have in our agreements for profit. And hold an option to purchase the uh, limited partner interest for a defined price, uh, which capitalizes fair market value or the sum to pay benefits plus in, in the investor tax, investors tax. Uh, I just want to highlight this, this fair market value definition. If it is a defined term, term in the um, partnership agreement, that may differ from what like for an appraised value would be, which an appraised value will probably come back, they'll, they'll determine fair market value, but that may not equate to the definition that's in your partnership agreement. So you have to look at uh, that closely to determine how you uh, structure your price for, for the buyout option. And case studies will have similar uh, economics to the partnership. We have 40 units. Cal needs are $80,000. Assumptions, obviously. We have um, 273 600 We have 69 6 We do the math. We subtract the income less the expenses. We come up with a net operating income. Now, typically, when this is called the income approach to valuation. When you're applying this direct cap or direct capitalization approach to value, uh, capitalize next year's net operating income. Counting an investor's buying future benefits. So, what past years may be used to determine what next year's uh, year 16's NOI is going to be. Uh, we're going to capitalize year 16's NOI, assuming a sale in one one two and. One one of sixteen, year sixteen. And why is generated in this calculation is uh, three four replacement reserves. 
Now, when it comes to determining value, market value of the real estate, the number that you see in your partnership agreement for the required replacement reserves may differ from what the market's actually paying today. So, in enterprise, we look at certain publications and track certain market dynamics to determine what the current per replacement reserve uh, requirement or underwriting standard is uh, to value the real estate. So we we're typically around 350 a unit right now. So we multiply that by the number of units we come up with 14,000. Track that from your unadjusted NOI to arrive at an adjusted NOI of $100,000. Um, that on the property, 9%, obviously, this was written 115 years ago when interest rates were different. But there's a term of 17 years on the loan. And these two numbers are kind of important when we compare this to the uh, area where there's debt deal or refinance scenarios. Uh, while the annual payment is, is 97798 this, this gives us a net cash flow of 2202 So that's just the debt service subtracted from the adjusted NOI. But remember, is that 2202? So, bring our value. We start adjusted NOI, again, that's after um, reserves. And we have a market derived cap rate. Um, enterprise, we look at certain publications, PWC survey or investor surveys, our brokers, we have uh, other third party data sources where we can try to narrow down what the appropriate cap rate is in a market, and we utilize your NOI. Now, this is another item that comes up as a surprise when we have first conversations with the uh, partners is, well, much is restricted to their candy value here. Well, if that net operating income, there's going to be value to the real estate. There may not be value to the partnership, but as long as NOI is positive and you cap it by a number, you're going to come up with some value to the real estate. So, in this case, we have a, a uh, Property value of 1.2. We as we come up with a total of 1,550,000. Talk to capital needs of, of the pro property area. Here we have $80,000. We do math, take it, subtract it from the existing debt of 1,550, which consists of 850 and a second mortgage of 700. So that from the abilities and plus capital needs of the partnership. Over the price, rather, and we come up with a negative fair market value of the partnership. And you see that $80,000 negative. So there's no value really here to distribute. Uh, if you were to go through the buyout option and the right of first refusal option, uh, you'll, you would see that they they wouldn't make economic sense. If, if the proper if the project's upside down already, there's not, not a, a lot of there's nothing to distribute. Calculations, for example, this example, excuse me, um, we have a, we're assuming a capital account balance of, of negative 500,000, so the property went negative, the property the capital account went negative. We're assuming a 35%, we apply that and we come up with an exit tax of 175,000. For this, we're just going to apply a one time gross up of uh, 1.5, we arrive at a total tax, exit tax that it will be due of 236,250. The option price was defined as the fair market value of the partnership interest, which we just determined as zero, or paid benefits plus exit tax, 236,250. So zero is 236,000. The usual price would have been uh, taxes, 1,950 plus 236 comes as 1,786,000. If we were to purchase the acquire the to purchase the limited purchase at the defined buyout option price, we come up with essentially the same number. It's preferable. Neither. Transaction the general enterprise agreed to a transfer of the LP and their interest for debt only. The investor is going to above the exit tax, which is a requirement. Is typically linked towards the investor absorbing the taxes on a deal that's upside down where there's no value to the partnership. You know, we're going to leave the reserves with the partnership. 
or reasons for the structure would be to the fact that we have a nonprofit sponsor that's uh, providing affordable housing and, and communities that are needing the housing, then delivered, and received what they were promised. Again, they have a limited partner interest, so why would an entity pay more for something that it's worth? And this structure, this transfer of limited partner interest, typically create uh, fewer costs because it won't be transfer tax uh, as compared to a transfer tax of real estate, for example. Scenario is a case study with value. The difference here is going to be the debt. We have an NI operate same amount up to one million five fifty. The same capital need, but the existing debt is less. This is only million five or one point one. And we come up with a partnership value, fair market value of the partnership of three hundred and twenty thousand. Now here we applied 99% to the fair market value of the limited partner interest. This detailed, uh, more detailed probably for this conversation, but I'm going to mention it. Um, there's waterfalls in the partnership agreement that are typically applicable at year 15 when it comes to valuing uh, the partner interest. Not only valuing limited partner interest, but also in a refinance scenario um, in a, on any year. But one is the capital proceeds water. Fall, and that's what we call a residual split. If we have a market valuation of a limited interest uh, relying on a third party appraisal, this is where they would use it, spelled out in your partnership agreement. Um, and again, it's kind of referred to as, as a residual split. And assuming it's 99%, which is, which is very common. But there's also, if there's an event that triggers the liquidation of the partnership, that I mentioned uh, both the right first refusal and often the calculation of the buyout option, depending on how it's defined in the partnership agreement, uh, if that option is defined as you know, hypothetical sale of the partnership, or the, excuse me, of the property, and as he's distributed to the partners, what the hypothetical sale uh, um, taxes, which affect capital accounts, but it also uh, triggers the liquidation, which takes to a different waterfall, typically in a partnership agreement. And the liquidation waterfall, if you will, or the dissolution waterfall, typically is driven by capital account balances. Well, the capital account balance of the limited partner will be considerably higher than that of the general partner. So this is a surprise that you're 15 when you do your math and realize, wait a minute, I'm the partner and I thought I was going to be walking away with this excess money to keep in the partnership, and in fact, I have to... Um, Spend the limited partner interest. So you have to pay attention to which which water waterfall you're in, and it's really, um, not that difficult. You just got to while the transaction is happening. Is it still the, the real estate, whether it's inferred or actual, uh, or is it a some type of, of evaluation, which again is driven by a different residual split, if you will. All that's going to rely on the 99% for this calculation. 99% of 320,000 is 316. And then trying to come up with value of the fair market value and the fair market value of a limited partner interest versus like a 100% equity stake in a, in a real estate or a partnership uh, has discounts that are applicable. And these the two main primary discounts that are applied when value limited partner interest are a lack of a discount for lack of control and a discount for lack of marketability. And these are applied separately, but for understanding here, we're just using one number. We typically do see around 25, roughly 5% for each, unless there's a ROFR involved or some extenuating circumstances. Um, so we're assuming a 50% disc for lack of control marketability, and that brings our 316 down to 158. Pair our, our our prices options as before. We have now we have a fair market value of partnership at 158. Uh, the unpaid benefits plus tax. The greater number again is the exit tax. So the area is driven by the exit tax taxes. 
We pay prices. We we have a right of first refusal, which would have been, which is a lower number as and that's going to deal without value. Uh, 0.1 plus 236, we come up with 1,386,250 for value, right or first refusal. If we had that option, we come up with the same number, 1,386,250. So, which is preferable? Again, it's neither. Yeah. The enterprise agreed to transfer a limited partner interest for 158,400, which was the Fair market value of the of the interest, you know, third party, if you will, valuation of third party interest. It's not the exercise per the play per the partnership agreement, but it's the fair market value of the interest. Uh, the general is going to refinance the property in order to generate what's needed to acquire the interest equity in the real estate, so we can do that. And we're going to stay with the partnership. Some reasons for doing it structure in this fashion. Uh, the exit tax that 236 obviously exceeds the value of the limited partner interest. So again, if somebody paid more for uh, something that, than what it's worth, they have a hard time making that happen. That's for some extraordinary motivation. Action pr purchase price will offset some of the investors' exit tax, and by structuring it, in action is the sale of the limited partner interest. There's not going to be any uh, state transfer tax for the rate, um, and therefore for cost. All of your costs associated with the dissolution of, of the partnership, which would happen if the real estate sold, would be a triggering event that would trigger the, the dissolution of the partnership. Just a couple slides here to talk about the refinance scenario. I'm going to go through these two quickly. Um, here we have NOI, the $100,000. We have a uh, debt service. Of 8,957. There's two methodologies that are presented here for uh, determining how much you could borrow. One is the, the, so the debt to coverage ratio. Uh, when well, math using a DCR, we come up with a loan amount of 1,036,000. The other methodology that banks typically use is the loan to value ratio. And banks today will typically lend the, the lesser of the two. Um, so the, Use percent LTB. We can, we have a loan amount, maximum loan amount of a million dollars. That's just less than the number generated using the DCI analysis. We're going to assume a loan of a million dollars. Now we have an annual payment of 83906. Uh, we have adjusted cash flow after reserves, et cetera, of 1694. And here we've improved our cash flow by 13, almost $14,000 annually. Not only, uh, well, they not only acquire the limited partner interest, but because of today's interest rates, they can improve operation or improve uh, cash flow, not necessarily operation. But. Mm -hmm. And sources and uses document, which is just typically you see the sources and uses add up. But um, sometimes, you know, we're seeing this often that um, a refinance scenario. Mm -hmm. Uh, a methodology for negotiations as, as well. Um, you know, if both sides are going to come to agreement on what's written in the partnership agreements for the price, whether that be the buyout option price or a right of first refusal, uh, maybe the, we saw partners present offers where uh, they want to do a refinance and they want to distribute the proceeds partnership agreement. And that, that dollar amount may exceed or may not. Uh, may not exceed the buyout option or the right of first refusal price, but um, it's a shaded amount that may be attractive to both sides. There's no, no, no motivation to do the buyout option or the right of first refusal. And if that's the case, you could perhaps your sources, you, you know, you might borrow more money uh, than your immediate uses, or you would add perhaps the, the value limited partner interest, uh, purchase price of limited partners to your uses. To finance the acquisition that, that way. Some of the takeaways from just the evaluation of the uh, analysis and also the whole patient we've had here is our transfers involve a simple transfer of a limited partner interest um, through all the dispositions we have done. And also, this correlates directly with a study I did back in 2012 or 
7% or more transactions involve the transfer of the partner interest to the current general partner. If they acknowledge the partner of the property, they're motivated to provide affordable housing, uh, and they're, in, they're in the business for that reason, and it makes it cleaner and, and uh, do the transfer. Um, the expense use period, which could be, again, 15 or 30 more years or more, um, by the need for properties to have plenty of resources available to them to pay for those needs, re replacement reserves, et cetera, cash flow, shortfall, et cetera. Equity be delayed considerably. Again, I mentioned HUD. If there's a requirement or a TPA requirement, that can uh, you want to look at that early on in your loan documents and make sure that uh, consent can be obtained relatively quickly. Quickly, I often see deals that are taking real long to get through. Uh, this position are the, the prime obstacle is getting uh, lender consent, assuming that we've already negotiated a deal. Um, Again, account balances may dis may drive the value, quote unquote. When I say it's just what, it what would be distributable to the partners, um, and that would be an area where if the partnership property was assumed to be sold, or it was actually being sold either one. But the applicable split that would be applied to a refinance distribution was, would also be the same one. The evaluation of a fair market value interest, and that would be the last bullet here. Uh, again, capital proceeds splits can drive that value, if you will. Point. We're going to up to questions. A couple of questions in the and uh, if you have questions, this is a great time to start typing them in the Q&A box on your lower right-hand side of the screen. Let's see. Question number one. If the – oops, I just lost it. I apologize. There we go. If the T wishes to reallocate the losses in the case where your capital account is starting to go in the negative, does it pose an issue if the managing member is a tax-exempt 501c3? Yeah. How do you get around that if this does pose an issue? So I know Enterprise, we do have language in the LPA that says what happens if we do reallocation. Something like you're trying to do voluntary reallocation. We don't usually have fancy threes as general partners on, on, on the partnership level. We get some, some single purpose entity. It would be able to take losses. If they're an LLC and they're limited, then we'd have to do something else. But most of the times, our public agreements do talk about reallocating losses. And in some cases, some of the deals that we've recently closed, we have capped the losses that go to the limited partner. So you'd have to look at that individual deal to see how it was structured. Okay. Next question. Has Enterprise had investments in properties which had tax credit recapture between years 10 and 15 due to vacant units or compliance issues? Yeah, we've had a, a, a probably not something that we see a lot because we do a lot of compliance on the front end and through office management team, so we don't have a whole lot of those. But we've had instances where project got a uh, 8823 and was not able to restore those units and we had to go and do recapture and make the, the investor whole from that experience. Next question. In early egg scenarios, how does the investor uh, a bank determine any CRA related impact factors? They tend to look at that in, internal to their organization, which we would not have insight into, but we, we do know that some investors have taken that into consideration. Next question. Market conditions. 
common is voluntary foreclosure in order to get out of ongoing restrictions. Uh, it has happened. It's been extremely rare. I think I can count of cases on hand. And again, these are usually projects that are struggling, so they're not trying to necessarily flip market. Um, they, they truly are in a troubled state. Um, they would have to be in order to kind of qualify for a voluntary foreclosure. They have to at least be at risk of a default notice. And <clears throat> they tend to open up their operations a little bit further so that they can improve operations. Thank you. We just have a few minutes left. Um, or Sean or Candy, do you have any uh, last uh, comments for us? Everybody for attending. I know this was um, a long one, and we packed in a lot of information. And uh, we continue to be available for questions. Yeah, our information is on the, the end of this presentation, so feel free to reach out. And I will add that a, a copy of the slides and of the recording of the session will be made available to all attendees. If there's nothing more, we will log out. Thank you again to Sean Barnes, Laura Turner, and Candy Felix for your presentations. Thank you to our attendees for joining us today. We hope to see you online again soon. Goodbye.